We have been talking about buffering and buffered solutions. So this last section of unit eight is talking, it talks about how do we know the buffering capacity or how well a buffered solution can absorb a change in protons or hydroxide ions without a significant change to the pH. So whenever you have a large capacity of or excuse me, a large concentration of buffering components, uh, large being, you know, greater than one molar, then that makes the best buffer where there will be relatively no change with to the pH with a large amount of protons or hydroxide added. But if you have very small, then it will have a significant amount. And this is because of the pH of the buffered solution is determined by the, the concentration of the conjugate base over the, the concentration of the acid ratio that we talked about in 8.9 with the Henderson Hasselbach equation. So this ratio determines the buffering capacity uh, based upon all of our concentrations in the buffered solution. So let's see how that works for two different concentrations in example 19. So we want to calculate the change in pH that occurs when 0.01 mole of gaseous hydrochloric acid, HCl, is added to one liter of each of the following solutions. So solution A, we have five molar acid, acetic acid and five molar sodium acetate. And solution B, we've got 0.05 molar concentrations for both of those parts of the buffered solution. So um, this situation, we're actually going to add an acid this time instead of a base, which we've been doing recently. So uh, the reaction equation is slightly different this time. So for the reaction equation, and I'm, we're gonna do a solution eight over here. Uh, we are gonna add the gaseous HCl is, is adding protons to the mix, okay? So, and that's because HCl is one of our strong acids that completely dissociates. And that will react with the conjugate base. I'm just gonna write A minus for this uh, instead of writing the C2H3O2. And by reacting with the conjugate base, it will form more of the acid, acetic acid. So it's 0 0.01 moles of the hydrochloric acid added to one liter. So that just makes that we have 0 0.01 molar concentration of that from that hydrochloric acid. And the concentration in, for solution A of the Na acetate, the sodium acetate, is five molar and the acid also has an initial concentration of five molar so this is before they're added okay now the reaction happens and we've got to use up the rest of these protons from the hydrochloric acid so we're going to subtract away 0 0.01 from both reactants and add 0 0.01 for the acid on the product side. So after they react, the new concentrations, we have zero concentration now for the proton from the hydrochloric acid. The conjugate base is 4.99 and the acid is now 5.01. Okay, since this is a buffered solution, I'm gonna go ahead and use the henderson hasselbach equation from 8.9 because it will make things a lot easier. So, and we have all the information to plug in there. Um, now, this wasn't given with this problem. I probably should have put it on here, but if you look back on example 16, it gives the Ka for this acid, acetic acid. Uh, the Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the negative five. So we need that for the, for the equation and that's just something that I forgot to include because we've been using this acid a lot with our examples. Okay, so back to this, let's figure out the pH of our solution. 
So we have to take the pKa, so negative log of the Ka, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, plus the log of the concentrations of base over acid, so 4.99 over 5.01. Okay, well, this turns in the, the negative log of the Ka, the pKa is 4.74. And then the log of our ratio turns into, and this is a very small number. Uh, I put it in scientific notation because it was so small. 1.78 times 10 to the negative three. Okay. Well, if I add those two together, we get 4.738, which is not rounded correctly. So to round it correctly, we still just need to keep 4.74. Okay. So the what this means is this 4.74, that is the pH value that we calculated back from example 16. If you look back there. Um, that was the buffered solutions pH. So since adding the 0 0.01 molar to the five molar solution, we had no change in pH. Which means that it was a very good buffered solution. It didn't even affect the pH at all for that. So then now let's try it for B when we have a significantly smaller concentrations to start. Okay. So the process is going to start the same where we have our proton, our H plus coming from the HCl. It will react with the conjugate base to form acid. This time we still have the 0 0.01 molar for the initial of the hydrochloric acid concentration, but the conjugate base and the acid now each have 0 0.05 molar for their concentration. Significantly smaller. The same process still applies to save some space. I'm not going to write the before reaction after this time, but it's following the same process. So that's a subtraction. So we're subtracting away to use up the H plus and we're adding that much more to the acid. So after the reaction takes place, now we have 0 0.04 for a concentration of the conjugate base and 0 0.06 for the acid. Okay. So when we solve for the new pH for this one, um, I'm going to save some time because we're, the first step for the equation will be negative log of the Ka, the pKa, and I already solved for that right here. So I already know that the number is going to be 4.74, so I'm just plugging that in. But we still have to add the log of our base of our acid concentration. This time, that turns into negative 0.7176, which is significantly bigger than the last situation in the log of the concentration ratio. So this time the pH is going to change. And when we add those together and round, I got 4.56. Okay, so this is a significant change. where it had a change. If we think back um, to what it, uh, the pKa is, that's a difference of 0.18. So the change in pH is 0.18, which is a pretty large change compared to, you know, no change from A. So uh, the point, the illustration that this is trying to make is that when you have higher concentrations of your buffering components, your weak acid and conjugate base, or the sodium salt, 
then that makes a better buffer. The capacity to buffer or have limited change to the pH is greater when you have higher concentrations of those components. If they're very small concentrations, it's more difficult to resist a pH change. Okay, so to make the most optimal buffering solution, we would think that the acid concentration should be equal to the base concentration. Okay, so and that's because at this condition that ratio is most resistant to change because it would be if you took the negative log or excuse me, just the log of one over one, for example, or the ratio is just turning into a one, that is a zero. So then that would make the pH equal to the pKa, which would resist the most change when any other protons or hydroxide ions are added to the solution. So when you're choosing a buffering component for a specific application, you want the ratio to equal one, because if that happens, like I said, I know that this is a lot, um, but if like you have the concentration is the log of one, right, that's zero. So then in conclusion from all this, the pH would just equal the pKa. the pKa and the pH are equal to each other when the ratio is equal to one, okay? So the pKa of a weak acid would then be used to buffer, be, be used in the buffer and it should be as close as possible to the desired pH. This is useful for many purposes. Like something that I use it for in chemistry class would be to calibrate pH meters when we use pH meter, which we're going to use at the end of the year, um, you have to calibrate it to teach it what certain pH levels are. So then when you stick it into an unknown solution to read the pH, it's, it's calibrated so that it knows where that should fall. And so usually with a pH meter, you calibrate with pH levels of about four and about 10. So you have something acidic and something basic to go by and also distilled water to be neutral seven as well um, uh, biochemical application um, we talked a little bit about earlier this unit about how your bloodstream has to have a very specific ph it's actually slightly acidic because of the carbon dioxide um, that we breathe but so when they're designing medicines they want to make sure that they might need to use a buffered component in their medicine so that if you're putting it into your bloodstream, it won't change your pH level of your body. So example 20, we are given a list of acids that uh, could be possible to use to make a buffered solution. And we want the buffered solution to have a pH of 4.30. So we want to calculate the ratio of acid over base required for the system that would yield a pH of 4.3. And so we want to pick the acid that when we have this ratio of acid over base concentration, then we can see that the pH level is closest to the 4.3 as possible, because then that would mean that the pKa is equal to the pH. Okay. Now, um, to help us solve for this, I'm getting this equation from page six from 8.8, .8, where uh, the H plus concentration is equal to the Ka times the acid over the base concentration. And what this came from, if you look back on page six, is the rearranging of the equilibrium expression for the Ka, for the weak acid. Now, since we want the ratio, we want this number to be as close as possible to what we need for the pH, I am actually going to divide and get the Ka out of there. So when I solve, I'm actually going to use what, where we're gonna take the H plus concentration divided by the Ka, and then that will give us 
the HA concentration over the conjugate base, the acid over base concentrations. So we have the information to plug in here, or we almost have it, we'll figure it out in a second. Um, and so when we are solving for these numbers, the ratio of the H plus over the Ka for these four acids, then whichever one we get the answer to be closest to one, that tells us that this would be one. So we want to find the ratio that's closest to one, okay? Now, um, before we do anything else, we need to actually find out what the top number is going to be. And we can find that from our pH value, right? So we were told that the pH is 4.30. So in order to find the H plus concentration, we have to take the inverse of the log, which that would be taking 10 raised to the power of the negative pH. So 10 to the negative 4.30. And that gives us that the H plus concentration is 5.0 times 10 to the negative 5. Full work. Okay. So this number right here, we're going to plug into the numerator when we solve. And the Ka values are given from each of the assets. Now, I should have done this and I didn't. Let's just say A, B, C, and D. So starting with the chloroacetate acid, that'll be A, and working our way down, okay? So for A, I'm going to take my concentration of my acid, or sorry, excuse me, the concentrated, concentration of the H plus divided by the Ka, 1, 0.35 times 10, the negative 5. Okay, and I get that to be a very small number, and I put in scientific notation, 3.7 times 10 to the negative 2. So that's probably not going to be your choice, because remember, we wanted it to equal 1, so that we know that the pKa is equal to the pH, but, or this ratio is equal to 1, so that we could know that, but um, it might be the best. I don't know. We'll have to do the rest. Okay, next B. For the propanoic acid, we're going to have the same number in the numerator, our H plus concentration, but this time the Ka is 1.3 times 10 to the negative 5. I'm sorry, you guys. I wrote this down wrong, but the answer is right. This is times 10 to the negative 3 for A. I apologize. It is times 10 to the negative 5, though, for and that equals 3.8. So this one is way too big for the ratio. So I would say we probably would pick A at this point. But let's keep going. So for C, the numerator is the same. Denominator, let me get it right this time, for benzoic acid is 6.4 times 10 to the negative 5. And that is, I got 0 0.78. That's pretty close to one. That's a lot better than 3.8, that's for sure. And it's, it's also better than A. So that might be our winner. Hopefully, maybe B will be one exactly, but if not, that might be it. Okay, so for D, take our H plus concentration divided by the Ka for hypochlorous acid, which is 3.5 times 10 to the negative 8, and that, ooh, that's really big, and at 1.4 times 10 to the positive 3, way too big, way too big. So, looking at all these numbers for all these ratios, the 0.78 is closest to 1. It's not perfect, but based on what the chemist has available, then that means that C was called benzoic acid, so the benzoic acid is the best choice from these to make the buffered solution. 
you maintain the pH of 4.30. It might not be perfect, but the pH when uh, things are added to it might, well, mostly they would significantly not change compared to others. Okay, so like uh, we see right here, sometimes we can't make a perfect buffered solution. So when the buffer has more conjugate acid than base, meaning that the conjugate acid has, um, it has a greater concentration, then the, the greater buffer capacity will happen for the addition of added base. So if the conjugate acid is more prevalent in the buffer, it will have the better buffer capacity or better job of keeping and maintaining pH when you add base to that solution. And the opposite is true if you have more conjugate base in the buffer, then it's going to do better. It will have a better buffering capacity when you add acid. And that's because if it has more conjugate acid, it's going to be a more acidic buffer. And if it has more conjugate base, it's going to be a more basic buffer. And so it would make sense based on the type of buffer it is, which one it would do a better job at maintaining pH. So that wraps up unit eight, all about acids and bases that have two different phases.